And happy Valentine's Day to everybody in the audience. Welcome to the second night of our festival, the Savannah Book Festival. If you were here last night for the opening with Joseph Cannon, then you already know my name is Bo Anders. I'm the president of the board of the book festival. If you're not with us, please let me say again on behalf of my fellow board members and the 250 volunteers who make this festival a reality every year, we're delighted you're here for our keynote address with John Grisham. The festival wouldn't be able to bring these amazing voices to our beautiful city without the generosity of Georgia Power, Bob Faircloth, David and Nancy Cintron, and the Philip B. and Nancy B. Beekman Foundation. We truly appreciate your support. I'd also want to recognize Mrs. Gerald Stevens, Helen Stevens tonight as a generous sponsor of George Griffin, Grisham. Thank you, Helen, for making this possible. We'd also like to thank our donors and volunteers who contribute time, human, and financial resources that enable the festival to attract these noteworthy authors and make them feel at home while they're here. And though I can't name you all, please know you are appreciated. I have a few more special thanks to share. First, to the festival's executive director, new executive director, Eric Dongre, who's done a great job this year along with her assistant director, Tara Setter. They put in countless hours to make this happen, so let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and one very special person who's been with the festival since the beginning and is asked to slow down next year, Jack Romanos. Jack's been an integral part to our success, and we hope he doesn't totally disappear. He won't. We won't let him. And finally, to the members of the Savannah Newcomers Book Club One and Lit in the Afternoon for ushering us to your seats in this crowded theater tonight, thank you very much. Also, a very special thank you to the 23 author authors who arrived early to participate in the SBF in Schools program. Through this program, festival authors visited public and private middle and high schools and universities in our community, uh, giving the Savannah students a chance to interact with them and sharing their early educational experiences, influences, and successes in their writing lives. And also, very importantly, this year we've been awarded a grant from the City of Savannah Cultural and Arts Investment Program which will help us make this SBF in Schools program even more enriching for our Savannah students. So thank you to the city. <laughs> right, and with respect to that, I'd like to particularly thank, because uh, thank Chris Howdy and James L. Haley, two authors that are here. Yesterday's storms caused significant travel issues, and two of our authors were unable to get here in time for their schools this morning. So Chris and James volunteered last night after their own long day of travel to step in and promote their love of writing at the local schools this morning. Thank you for your dedication and enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah, you might, you might know that because of the um, ticket sales that were so abundant here for tonight, the authors and their guests are not in this room tonight. But this is being streamed over across the street to the SCAD library. And so they're all over there. And they will be at our event at the end for the, uh, the author, Meet the Author Party. Um, be sure to download the new Savannah Book Festival app for tomorrow to, just, to search um, the App Store and Google Play for Savannah Book Festival 2020. That'll help you around tomorrow. Now, before we get started, Please turn off your cell phones so you hear this every night we're here. No flash photography. And for the question and answer portion, please only one question and no stories. <laughs> so it is my great honor to be able to introduce John Grisham tonight. We're thrilled to have him here, and I think you'll enjoy the event. He's an American novelist, attorney, politician, and activist. 
and is obviously best known for his legal thrillers. His books have been translated into 42 languages and published worldwide with sales exceeding 300 million. Long before his name became synonymous with the modern legal th thriller, he was working 60 to 70 hours a week at a small South Haven, Mississippi law practice, squeezing in time before going to the office and during courtroom recesses to work on his hobby, writing his first novel. Born in Jonesboro, Arkansas to a construction worker and homemaker, John Grisham as a child dreamed of being a professional baseball player. Realizing he didn't have the right stuff for a pro career, he shifted gears and after graduating from law school at Old Miss, he went on to practice law for merely a, uh, nearly a decade in South Haven, specializing in criminal defense and litigation, personal injury litigation. In 1983, he was elected to the State House of Representatives and served until 1990. One day at the, at the DeSoto County Courthouse, Grisham overheard the harrowing testimony of a 12-year-old rape victim and was inspired to start a novel exploring what would have happened if the girl's father had murdered her assailants. Getting up at 5 a.m. every morning to get in several hours of writing time before heading off to work, he spent three years on a time to kill and finished it in early in 1987. Initially rejected by many publishers, it was eventually bought by Winwood Press with a modest 5,000 copy printing. That might have put an end to his hobby. However, he had already begun his next book. And it would quickly turn that hobby into a new full-time career and spark one of the publishing's greatest success stories. A story you all know is one of the hotshot young attorney lured to an apparent perfect, apparently perfect law firm that was not what it appeared. Spending 47 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, the firm became the best-selling novel of 1991. Grisham took time off from writing for several months in 1996 to return after a five-year hiatus to the courtroom. He was honoring a commitment made before he had retired from the law firm, representing the family of a railroad brakeman who was killed when his, he was pinned between two cars. Preparing his case with the same passion and dedication as his book's protagonist, Grisham successfully argued his client's case, earning them the biggest verdict of his career. When he's not writing, Grisham devotes time to charitable causes, including most recently his Rebuild the Coast Fund, which raised $8.8 .8 million for the Gulf Coast relief effort in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. He also keeps up with his great passion, baseball. The man who dreamed of being a professional baseball player now serves as the local Little League commissioner. <laughs> the six ball fields he built on his property have played host to over 350 kids on 26 Little League teams. Please welcome John Grisham. Thank you. Thank you, Bo. Thank you, Savannah. It's a pleasure to be back. Uh, happy Valentine's Day. Uh, I am very happy that because today my Valentine is here with me. Uh, Renee made the trip. If you add the two years we dated, plus the 39 years we've been married, this is our 41st Valentine's. And uh, things are going well. <laughs> We're new grandparents. We have two grandkids, so life is really good. Um, we're delighted to be back in Savannah. Our first trip to Savannah was uh, in July of last year. We keep sort of a um, list, not a bucket list, but a list of places we want to go to, places we haven't seen both here and abroad, and we are, we're always <clears throat> working on the list. And Savannah was at the top for years, and uh, we weren't getting any closer to it. And so I did what I often do when I write a book that can be set anywhere. I pick a town I want to go to, and I write the book there. I set the book there. That makes me go there and do research. And I've done this uh, in the U.S. and even towns abroad. And so um, after I had written the first draft of The Guardians about a year ago, it was time to do the research and clean up the, all the mistakes. And so we came to Savannah uh, in late July. It was nice and cool. 
<laughs> but we're used to warm weather, so it didn't bother us. We, we, we had a list of places we had to check off to see to verify, you know, where the action takes place. Because if you get something wrong, and I do all the time, you get hate mail for years to come. Uh, and some of it's very, very ugly, and people get offended if you get their streets wrong or if you get any kind of facts wrong. Um, and, and the paperback lives on forever, and so the mail keeps coming in forever. And um, uh, one of the worst things I've ever done, a book called The Partner, had a different ending from what I thought would the ending would be. And it was a surprise ending, and um, I was surprised when Renee liked it. And I was surprised when New York liked it, so the, the surprise ending stayed in the book. Uh, I still get hate mail from around the world from people who hate the ending of the partner. So we, we, we do our research a little bit. Uh, I, I, don't, I get, don't get too carried away, but I, I, we do like to travel around at times and see uh, various places. Um, when we got married 39 years ago, um, we were students at Ole Miss. I had finished law school, and Renee had finished two years of undergrad. She was an English major. And uh, I was not about to let her go back to college without me. And so I convinced her that we should get married. She was 20, I was 26. She was too young, and she wanted to finish school, but I didn't give her much of a choice. And the, the game plan back then was I was going to practice law for a year in our hometown make a bunch of money, and then we'd have the money, and she could go back to college commuting an hour away to Ole Miss. We had the plan. It was a plan. And after one year of practicing law, I, I think I was heavier in debt than when I started. The, the, the clients didn't show up, and I realized as a young lawyer with the law degree and, and, the, and the power that it gives you, I could not say no to people who were in trouble. I just couldn't, I just couldn't say no. And so for our, and if a young lawyer doesn't say no, you're going to be out of business pretty soon. And I, I realized that a lot of my clients couldn't pay. My clients were working people and injured people and people who couldn't pay me much at all, if anything. And so, uh, but I enjoyed that for a while. And uh, for our second anniversary, the gift was our son. Uh, he, he arrived uh, two years later. And so we had to put college on them on the back burner further and further away. Renee started commuting though to Ole Miss and taking a few classes, uh, even with the kid. And she was studying English and we uh, have, I have great memories of us sitting up at night reading uh, and rereading all the books she, she had to read for, uh, for class. And we, we grew up with a lot of books. We grew up reading and we, we enjoyed uh, those times together. This was in the early 80s. Never once, not one time, did I ever have the desire to write. We never talked about writing. I never said, you know, I think I could write a book. I think I could maybe give that a shot. Maybe I could, you know, I have a story here. We just never, it was not a dream. It was not, it was not a childhood dream. It was not something that I studied in college. Um, it's something that just happened when I was 30 years old. And it happened, as, as Bo touched on a moment ago, it was, I was going to be a um, courtroom lawyer. I was inspired by some great trial lawyers in Mississippi I knew. When I was in law school, I watched the dockets nearby in federal court, and if a great lawyer was coming to town to try a case, I would I'd skip class. And I'd go to class and watch the, the good lawyers try cases. And that's, I saw myself as a courtroom lawyer. That was my goal when I was a young lawyer, very young. And so uh, I would always hang around the courtroom. If, 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 if a trial was in progress, <laughs> most of them were not my trials. I didn't have any clients. And, <laughs> Most of my clients were guilty, and I had to plead them when they went to prison anyway. I couldn't, I couldn't really try. <laughs> and I, but I just hung around the courtroom, and we had this horrible um, crime in our community. Summer of 1984, and a little girl was attacked, and it was terrible. And um, I didn't know the family. I knew of her dad, nice folks, but not the kind of people you want to start trouble with. And for for a couple of days, they caught the rapist, uh, who was a really bad guy. They caught him immediately, and, and um, the gossip, the whole town just sort of seed with this gossip that there may be some revenge, some retribution. The crime was beyond description, so I'm not even going to try. Um, 
she, she survived but barely and they caught him and the, and the family was going to do this, the family's going to do that. And this was 1984 in rural Mississippi and uh, it was, you know, some pretty intense um, moments, especially around the courthouse. Nothing happened to the family's credit. They waited for the system to take care of it. And a few months later, they brought this guy in for his trial. He, he, he had confessed when they caught him. He had just gotten out of prison for another assault. He was, again, he was a terrible person. And when they brought him in for trial, uh, typical me, uh, I was hanging around the courtroom. Had nothing to do with the case, which was often the case. And uh, I was just curious. As an officer of the law, an officer of the court, uh, you know, I had, I could watch any kind of trial. Um, they brought the little girl in to testify against this guy, and for about, I'd say about an hour, she testified. Our judge, my mentor, my favorite old judge, was so smart, he knew how bad it was going to be. He did something I had never seen before or since. He cleared the courtroom. No spectators. Everybody's out. And he put deputies at the door and the windows. Security was very tight. And being an officer of the court, I was allowed to stay with the clerks and a few other nosy lawyers, and we were kind of hanging around. And, and so we were locked in. We couldn't leave as much as we soon wanted to leave. And she testified, and for um, an hour, she, at times she was very brave, at times she was very frail. She led us through every emotion known to the human soul, from bitter hatred to love to compassion. It was just a roller coaster. There were times, I knew three ladies on the jury, and I was facing the jury, um, at times, all, tw all 14 jurors, 12 and two alternates, were in tears. And the lawyers, the judge, were they were hiding their faces, you know, but it was so powerful. The only person who didn't, who showed no emotion was the defendant, who never showed any remorse. It was just a really gut-wrenching moment that, looking back, as often happens in life, it changed, it, it would alter my life dramatically. Finally, when she broke down and she could not continue, the judge called for a recess, and uh, we could not wait to get out of the courtroom. And I took a back uh, exit through the, another room and down the back stairs as I knew how to do, and I ran to my car because uh, I, I had been emotional too. When I got to my car, I realized I'd left my briefcase in the courtroom, and I had no choice but to go back and get it. And I went back the back stairs, up the back stairway, through the holding room, and I was, there I was back in the courtroom. There was nobody there except the defendant sitting in the chair, you know, just sitting there. And a deputy was sort of guarding him, but not really. There was, there was nobody else there. It was a big courtroom. And I walked right by the guy to get my briefcase, and I had this thought. I said, had that been my daughter, okay, and I could get this close to you, I could get my retribution, and I would look at that same jury right there, and I would say, what are you going to do with me? I just did something that you all want to do. How can the system tolerate this? What can the system do? What will you, the 12 jurors, do to me? And I got out of there and came home, and um, I didn't tell Renee about it for a while. Uh, it was a very... Uh, dramatic, powerful. I became obsessed with this idea of a father's retribution and a trial in a small southern town like mine as seen through the eyes of an idealistic uh, young lawyer. And I became obsessed with this story. And finally I said, you know, this is not going to go away. I've never written anything before except legal briefs um, talk about a fiction. Um, <laughs> and late one night, uh, late in 1984, Renee had put our son down for bed. She was in the bed asleep. It was late at night. I took a legal pad from my briefcase. At the very top, I put uh, chapter one. That's what you're supposed to put when you start a book, chapter one. <laughs> I wrote the first 
paragraph in real neat block letters, as neat as I could be, because I thought maybe someday somebody might want to read this. And that went on for a few days and a few weeks. And um, finally, after I had chapter one finished, I mustered the courage to um, approach Renee and I said, hey, um, I got something I want you to read. She said, okay, what is it? And I said, it's a chapter one of a, of a novel. And she was very patient. I was so nervous, um, I left the house and walked around the block a few times while she was reading chapter one of what became a time to kill. And when I got back home, finally, she was in the kitchen, and I said, uh, so what do you think? She said, about what? <laughs> I said, about my novel, okay? About my novel. And she said, uh, I like it. Uh, I want to read some more. And I said, okay, I'll go write some more. I only have one chapter. <laughs> and that began a process that went on for almost three years. I would write a chapter and pin her down and make her read it. And it went back and forth. And I, I really got into the process and a lot of encouragement at home. And I would get up early and go to work early. People thought, my office on Main Street, people thought I was in there practicing law at 6.30 in the morning. And, uh, but I didn't have any clients. I was just in, you know, I was in a writing. Grisham was writing again. Nobody knew that. And uh, there were times when I was, uh, I would quit, I would stop. I recall walking in bookstores and I would see the, a big wall of um, all the new releases from the big publishers in New York and I would say, who wants to hear from me? What do I have to say? Um, but I, I kept going. There were times uh, when I wouldn't touch it for a few weeks or a month. And, and Renee would say, where's, where's the next chapter? Where's the next chapter? And after, um, after three years, the book was finished. And I began submitting the book at random to New York. This is way before the internet. And I had a list of agents and a list of publishers. And I would send out you know, the typical first three chapters. And they would send them all back. And the rejections were. Well, they reject them real fast. And um, one time I came home from the state capitol on a Friday. I ran by the office, and there was a stack of rejection letters. Well, to me, the, the rejection, submission rejection was kind of fun because it livened up my life. I wouldn't, this was a hobby, okay? I was practicing law, suing people, and, you know, that's what I was supposed to be doing, uh, not writing. I, 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 didn't, I never got depressed. I, I kept going, and <clears throat> there was a whole stack of rejection letters I went home and we were having dinner late Friday night and I told Renee, I said, I've got a bunch of rejections this week. And um, she, I said, she said, I'm sorry, I, you know, I know it's tough, but uh, we talked about it. She said, you know, you're sending the first three chapters of the book and, and those are not the three strongest chapters. Why don't you send this chapter, this chapter, and that chapter? Like chapter one, chapter four, chapter seven. And I said, just three chapters at random? She said, yeah. I said, that's pretty stupid. Who wants to read three, three, three random chapters? She said, well, you're not, you're not doing so hot with the first three, so why don't you? I said, okay, well, we're, we're having fun here. We're not, we're not doing this for a living, okay? And so I redid, the, got my secretary, I re redid the submission, chapters one, chapter four, chapter seven, and we sent those out. The batch of those went to New York. The next name's on the lists. And uh, within a week, Three of them had called, right? Uh, three agents had called within a week. And when the first two called the same day, I went home and I said, hey, two agents called. Uh, what, do we do? What, what, what do we do now? What's that? What's, uh, I'm not sure what to do. Tell them what to do. I signed up with an agent, and he, he was uh, rejected by everybody who'd already rejected me once or twice. And that went on for a year. And uh, again, that was a process. I was busy with the next book. And um, finally, Renee took the phone call one day when he called from New York to say that we had a publisher. And uh, it was a publisher we never heard of before, but we didn't care. We, uh, we maxed out on our credit cards. We took off to New York for the first time, two kids from Mississippi, and we were having a ball. Met our publisher at a bar at the uh, St. Moritz Hotel in Central Park South, which is kind of past its prime, but we stayed there because it wasn't very expensive. And that's where Mickey Mantle lived when he played for the Yankees. He always stayed, <laughs> he lived in the St. Moritz Hotel and he played for New York, so I thought that was appropriate. And we were in the bar, I had a nice bar with my publisher one time, and he handed us the first copy 
of A Time to Kill. Yeah, that was a big moment. The book was a total flop. Uh, they printed 5,000 hardback copies. Without telling Renee, I ordered 1,000. <laughs> and we were broke, okay? But I, I had it figured out. I was going to, I would, I would sell the books at retail and, you know, get the mark up there and then maybe get some, royal, some royalty action going on the back end, front end, back end. I, you know, I was, I, I was a whiz. I had it all figured out. <laughs> Renee stopped by the office one day and there were just stacked crates and stacks of books everywhere. She said, what, what, are, what are all these copies of A Time to Kill? And I said, well, I bought 1,000. She said, how much does that cost us? I said, well, uh, you know, it's a lot. But we're going to get it back. We're going to get it back because I'm going to have a book party at our local library. There was not a great bookstore in town. And I said, we're going to invite the whole town to come. This is the town we grew up in. Uh, this, this is a town that had elected me to the state legislature. You know, this is our friends, fam fam all our family lives there. We're going to have a huge book party, and we're going to have uh, all these books there. We, we still have photographs of our kids. This was 1989, so our son was six and our daughter was three. We have photos of our kids climbing on a thousand copies of A Time to Kill. <laughs> and it was, we had a fun party, great party, uh, big, big turnout, um, not quite big enough. Uh, when the party was over, we, we still, I, I still owned uh, 882 copies of A Time to Kill. <laughs> and the invoice was coming, okay? I, I was worried about the invoice. Um, and I said, okay, what do we do now? So I went to my librarian, and I said, hey, I can take this show on the road, you know? And I did for the next few months, and like 35 libraries later, I sold the last copy of A Time to Kill, uh, which is a really bad move, because um, those things now, a, a, a nice first edition goes for about $4,000. $4,000, and I had 1000 in the office. Um, <laughs> math is pretty easy. Well, it wasn't the only fortune I lost practicing law. Uh, but it didn't work out. Anyway, but by the time I'd finished, uh, by the time the uh, Time to Kill was published, um, I had been, I started working on the next book, and I, I told Renee, I said, look, this is a hobby. I'm going to do it one more time. I have one more book that I like, and I'm going to write that book a little bit faster and make it more commercial and hopefully reach a, a broader audience. And if the second book doesn't work, you can forget this hobby I'll just stop writing and just sue people full time. That's what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> and she said, what's the idea? I said, okay, listen, here's the pitch. And this still happens around the Grisham household. The pitch is a very crucial moment. Because first of all, I have to pin her down and get on her schedule and say, here's the idea for the book. And it's, it's actually a great exercise. If you can't pitch your story in... 30 seconds to 60 seconds, you probably got problems. And if you have to defend it, explain it, whatever, you're probably in trouble with your, probably your story. So the pitch, is, the pitch is crucial. And so the pitch was to her, it was based on something that really happened to law school, not in law school, not to me, but to someone else. I said, you've got this brilliant young law student uh, who uh, is heavily recruited. He's turning down offers from everywhere. He goes to work for an unknown a very wealthy firm in uh, an outpost like Memphis, Tennessee. And he doesn't know it, but the law firm is secretly owned by the mafia. And once you join the firm, you never leave. And I kept talking, and she said, stop. <laughs> she said, do that again. And so I pitched again, and she said, Renee, said, that's, that's a big book. That's a big book. If you can get that thing written, uh, forget about a time to kill. And so I worked on it diligently for two years, she, she was reading it uh, as I wrote it, and, and she was always a big fan, uh, a big believer in the firm, and that kept me going. And uh, we sent the book to New York in the fall of 1989, not long after A Time to Kill had come out. There was no demand for the firm. Some publishers saw it, and they, um, you know, we, we didn't have an offer. Uh, I was kind of waiting, I was eager, I was, you know, uh, really waiting on the phone call from New York, and it never came until later. And sometime around Christmas of 1989, uh, this used to happen in publishing, again, long before the Internet, a bootleg copy of the manuscript, all 600 pages, surfaced in Hollywood. Uh, studios used to pay scouts in publishing to, you know, get manuscripts or whatever, steal them or pay for them from the copy room. 
somebody got the book in Hollywood and, he, and made 20 copies of it and sent the cop, a copy to all the big studios and production companies and said, hey, this is, you know, this is, uh, this is a hot book. We had not sold the book. Uh, <laughs> but we weren't sure if it was going to sell. And he got nervous when they started making offers. And he hit, he, 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 the offers got higher and higher, and they, they, they dropped out. We knew nothing about it. My agent in New York knew nothing. And Renee always gets the good phone calls. This happened the first Sunday in 1990. I'd already gone to church. Uh, we lived about two blocks from the church. We had two kids. It would take three trips to get all of us to church at the same time. So I'd already gotten mad and gone to church. Uh, and she came to church, and she was, she was rattled. She said, go call New York. And I said, what's, what's going on? She said, it's something about a movie deal for the firm. I said, we don't have a book deal. <laughs> she said, shut up and go call New York. <laughs> so I skipped church and went, we well, skipped Sunday school. I went home and I called my agent in New York and I said, well, hey, what's going on? She, he said, look, uh, he said, things are hot. Um, at the last moment, uh, they, somebody said, hey, we should, we should check in with the author. And so my agent got involved. They had a big cuss fight. Everybody threatened to sue. And then, then they said, okay, wait a minute. This is about to end well for everybody. Let's be friends. And so the agent called us. And my agent on the phone, tough old guy in New York, and he said, I need your permission, authority. I need your authority to take the highest offer for the film rights to the firm from um, Universal Pictures, Paramount Pictures, or Disney Touchstone. I said, oh, okay, what's, going, uh, what's happening? He said, we can't talk right now. Uh, <laughs> he said, the studios are sitting by the phone waiting for the final round of bidding. Well, the word bidding had a real nice ring to it. And I, I, said, <laughs> I said, okay, Jay, uh, sure. Uh, yes, this is, that's hard to believe. I can't think right now. I said, and he went on and on. And I said, um, just for fun, uh, what kind of money are we talking about? He said, I'm asking for 500000 I hope to get 400000 And I said, you want my authority to go do that? <laughs> he said, I have to have your authority. I said, okay, you have my authority. And I went back to church, and we sat through the, we had this long-winded preacher we couldn't stand. <laughs> <laughs> he went on and on. It was, it was one of those, uh, we had communion, we had communion. Uh, we had my all-time favorite, the baby dedication service. There we go. <laughs> everything, everything. But that Sunday, we're sitting there just, you know, on our fingernails waiting to get home. And we finally raced home, and the phone was ringing, and it was New York. And the agent said, uh, I, just, I, I, I just sold the film rights to the firm to Paramount Pictures. I said, that's hard to believe. That's hard to believe. And then he started telling me how he had negotiated and roughed everybody up and beat up the L.A. guy. And all that. So finally I said, okay, Jay, um, just for fun, how much money do we get? He said 600000 I said, wait a minute, you were asking for half a million, hoping to get 400000 and you got 600000 How would you do that? He said, I'm a hell of an agent. <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen, brother. And I said, look, let me call you back. And we sat down at the kitchen table, uh, really rattled and shaken, and we were supposed to go to my mom's house next door for Sunday dinner, Sunday lunch, and, and we both grew up in really uh, <laughs> tight-knit, close-knit Southern Baptist families where you never, there are a lot of rules. <laughs> and w one rule, you never discuss money outside the family. I mean, you, that was a cardinal sin. There was no money inside the family, <laughs> but money was never discussed. And if you made some money, you didn't talk about it. You didn't show it. You didn't, you know, it, it was that conservative. And so we said, okay, look, this is obviously going to be a big game changer for us. We're going to tell people we sold the film rights. We are never, ever going to tell, talk about the money, okay? And we were dead serious. Um, the following day, uh, Paramount issued a press release <laughs> with all the details, all the details. 
So we learned that lesson, and we've, said, we've had uh, some movie deals since, and <laughs> there's always a confidentiality clause that so far they, they stick to. Uh, the, when the book came out, so, suddenly the publishers woke up in New York, and um, they wanted to buy the book, and so we, we sold the book to Doubleday, and then we sold the book. A Time to Kill did not sell enough copies to go to paperback. Or forget foreign rights. It, it, again, it, it was a flop. Um, but we're, suddenly we're selling rights in the UK and Germany, and, and for a year, the, the book just kind of marched around the world, language by language, contract by contract, and we, we could not believe, you know, what was happening to us. Uh, I was suddenly bored with the practice of law. Uh, <laughs> bored with uh, politics. Um, not bored with my wife. We, we, we stuck together. We hung in there. But we, we were bored with our hometown. And we moved, and we um, spent all of our money on a new house. Didn't have a mortgage, but we didn't have any money anymore. And uh, then the firm came out in March of 1991, almost 30 years ago, and, and became, um, became a bestseller. Watching my time here, uh, what I normally do is ramble, as I'm doing now, and then, and then take some questions. So if you have a question, hang on to it. We'll get to it in, in just a few minutes. Um, after the firm came out, then the, the other movies, The Pelican Brief and The Client, The Rainmaker, and A Time to Kill, and uh, life, was, life had changed dramatically for us. And so we moved from Oxford, Mississippi, our, kind of our hometown, where we got married and went to school. And we moved to Charlottesville, Virginia, 25 years ago. Thank you. And we did that because we didn't know a soul there. And we were looking for some privacy, and we bought an old house, really secluded, and, and we're still there. Well, we love it, and um, our son went to UVA, our daughter went to UNC, and we're, that's kind of our neck of the woods now, but we, we, ha we had to get away. And Over the years, um, we have continued to discuss each book before I write it. Again, I have to pitch it. She has to sign off on it. Uh, she loves to say no. Um, we fight. Um, our kid, our kid, when our kids were small, they loved to, they loved when we get into an argument about a book. We don't fight much, but when you, when, you, when your parents don't fight much and you hear them yelling, kids are going to come check it out. They love it, okay? They, they're going to see their parents fight. And our kids would come running down the stairs and they realize, oh, it's just a book fight. It's not a real fight. They're not fighting over anything but a, <laughs> a book fight. Uh, one time I wrote 100 pages of the most brilliant book I'd ever thought of. Legal thriller. It was, it was, I, I, I was losing sleep. The book was so good. And she read the first 100 pages, and she said, this really sucks. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll show you. So I sent the book to New York, to my editor. And he said, we are not going to sell this book to anybody. <laughs> so I can't fight both of them. Um, so she has vetoed uh, a number of books. She, she, will not let me, she, she will not let me be in the house when she's reading a chapter. As we get toward the end... Uh, she starts reading, you know, chunks of 100 pages, and, and she reads with a red pen. Uh, far too many little pissy comments in the margin. Uh, sometimes I'll put things in the book just to aggravate her. You know? I know they're coming out, okay? I know they're coming out. I love humor. I love, I love to write humor. I, 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 we all think we're humorous, but I love in a really tense situation, a courtroom or a boardroom or some plot scene, you know, whatever, to throw in something the reader is not expecting that is often hilarious. It's not going to stay in, uh, and that really irritates Renee because um, it, it makes her laugh, and she refuses to laugh. Uh, I wrote a book. I wrote, I wrote a book called Skipping Christmas one time that was just an anti-Christmas novel um, cause, because each year I'd love to skip Christmas, but with her, we're not skipping Christmas. That's where the motivation came from for the book. And I thought, I'm, I'm going to write a novel, and I'm going to throw in all the humor. I'm, it's a comic novel. It's a comic novel. I'm going to throw in all the humor I possibly can. And, and, and she can't take it out because it's a funny book. And I writ, I'd written the book. She didn't know about it. Uh, it took six weeks, and I was leaving town, and I gave her the manuscript, and she said, what is this? This is not the time of the year when I'm supposed to be playing editor, okay? I'm supposed to be off. I said, yeah, but you got to read this. And um, when I got back home, I, I called from the airport, and she said, I have one chapter to go, and I'm laughing so hard I can't read. 
that was the sweetest thing she's ever said to me. <laughs> uh, years ago, we got into this argument about uh, sex in novels. And she's always said, men cannot write sex. Okay? Uh, only women can write good sex scenes. And so I, I said, I'm not going to try. I'm not going you know, to embarrass myself. Um, and so we were doing an interview with somebody, and the, the lack of sex in my novels was mentioned by the interviewer. And um, when they piped, she couldn't wait to pipe in. She said, well, he doesn't write it about sex because he knows so little about it. I mean, that's, you know, national television. You get that from... It's pretty painful. Um, I always said I wouldn't write something that would embarrass my mother. Well, she passed away four years ago, and uh, somebody said, you have more sex in your books now. I said, well, I wrote a book called Camino Island. It came out three years ago, and there was a scene where the two main characters were finally together, and it was time for them to uh, hop in the sack. So I'm there. Yeah, I, I never get that far before in fiction. And so I was there. <laughs> I was there, and it was time to write this scene. And I thought, I can't start describing, you know, body parts and things like that. What, how do you write stuff like that? So I, I just had them wake up the next morning. That's, what, that's uh, <laughs> whatever they did. Over the years, Renee has encouraged me to write uh, the more serious stuff, issues like the death penalty, uh, environmental destruction, wrongful convictions, uh, tobacco litigation, insurance fraud and abuse, and I, my fiction has certainly gone that way. Uh, occasionally, she will get fed up with that and say, get off your soapbox and just go write an old-fashioned thriller. And so I listen to it. I do that. Um, in 2000. December of 2004, I was not looking for a book. It was not that time of the year. I start writing a book every year on January the 1st, and I give myself six months to write the book, and that's my schedule now. It wasn't back then, but I was flipping through the New York Times, and I love their obituaries uh, because they tell fascinating stories. And the lead obituary that day was a picture of a guy... <clears throat> uh, my same age race, as it turned out, same neck of the woods, same background, socioeconomic, religious, everything. We, we, were, we were a lot alike. And the headline said, um, Ron Williamson, uh, freed from death row, dies at 53. We're the same age. Oh, oh he was a year older. And I, he, he was standing in court with a badly fitting suit. It was the day he was. This the day he walked out of prison, and he he looked confused. He looked uh, like he couldn't believe what was happening to him. He looked pained. It was a it's a magnificent photograph, snapped by some stringer who was in the courtroom. And the first paragraph read something like this: Ronald Keith Williamson, who left his small town in Oklahoma with dreams of major league glory but was later convicted and went to prison and came within five days of being executed for a murder he did not commit, died last Saturday in a nursing home in Tulsa. He was 53. The cause was cirrhosis of the liver. Um, I spend a lot of time trying to hook you <laughs> in the first paragraph, or certainly the first page. Or the first chapter. If we get to the first, the first chapter, you're not hooked. I'm in trouble. Uh, but I was thoroughly hooked by that opening paragraph, and later talked to the guy who wrote it. The obituary went on. Ron was a, the first round draft pick of the Oakland A's in the 1972 draft, one year ahead of me. I, I didn't get drafted. <laughs> and many people in his small corner of Oklahoma thought he was the next Mickey Mantle, and he thought so too. He was that good. He went off to the minor leagues, blew his money. I uh, lost his bonus in a, in a poker game and started, uh, picked up bad habits and started showing signs of mental illness very young, crashed and burned out. There was a horrible murder in his small town that was unsolved for uh, five years, and they finally pinned it on Ron. And, 
and he was convicted and was almost executed. And th that, was the, that was the obituary. And I, I read the obituary, and I, said, I thought, man, this is, uh, this is a story that's too good to pass up. And I, I went to the phone, and I called my uh, publisher, Steve Rubin, at Double A, and I said, have you seen The Times this morning? Well, every serious New Yorker has seen The Times, okay? So he said, sure, I've seen The Times. I said, I said have you read the obituaries? He said, no. I said, well, read them and call me back. And within 10 minutes, Steve called back, and he said, this has got your name written all over it. I said, I've never written nonfiction. I don't know where to start, but this is my next book. Uh, within an hour, I'd contacted both of Ron's sisters. He had no surviving wife or children. He had two sisters that had taken care of him, one in Dallas, one in Tulsa. I got them both on the phone, and once we got past the, you know, uh, is this a gag? Um, we had a long conversation. I took off to Oklahoma. I had no idea what I was going to face. I spent 18 months researching and writing The Innocent Man, and it came out in 2006. That, that process took me into the world of wrongful convictions, where obviously I've never left. And I joined the board of the Innocence Project, and I still write about exonerations and wrongful convictions because there are so many of them. And that's, that's what The Guardian is all about. Um, there are thousands of innocent people in prison in this country. I didn't believe that. I, didn't, I never thought about it until I got into The Innocent Man and the research and learn the issues and talk to many, not many, but talk to some of the men who have served a long time for somebody else's crimes. These are fascinating stories uh, because of the human drama, the heartache, the misery, the corruption, the, the um, bad police work, bad prosecutors, bad defense work that goes into a typical wrongful conviction. They're great, I wish I could write all of them. And so I can't do that, so I, I fictionalize them. When I was, when I was writing, when I was researching The Innocent Man, I was in a lawyer's office in Norman, Oklahoma. It just stacks and stacks and stacks of boxes, files, whatever. These cases go on for 20 years, and the, the legal work is astonishing. And there were several boxes marked Property of Centurion Ministries, Princeton, New Jersey. I'd never heard of it. So I asked around. I finally made my way to Centurion Ministries in Princeton, founded by a guy named Jim McCloskey 45 years ago when he was a divinity student at Princeton, he got involved with a um, uh, prison ministry. He met an inmate who over time convinced Jim that the, he was innocent. He kept saying, I can prove it. Jim, with no legal background, no money, no trend, nothing, uh, sort of began digging, talking to witnesses, looking at police files. What? Long story short, two years later, Jim walked this guy out of prison, a free man, fully exonerated. And Jim said, at that moment, uh, he said, God told me, this is your calling in life. This is what you're supposed to do, is to free the innocent. He spent 45 years primarily by himself, um, going from state to state. Uh, he sacrificed a career as a minister. He sacrificed a family. He sacrificed everything because he was called to free the innocent. As of today, Centurion has exonerated 63 men and women. A few years ago, uh, I went to a fundraiser in, at Princeton that Jim invited me to. He had 19 of his guys there from all over the country, 19 men who had served a 1,000 years probably combined, and they would not have been there free if not for Jim McCloskey. Jim was the inspiration. He's still a hero to me. He was the inspiration for the Guardians. Okay. Who's got a question? <laughs> Thank you. you can you can yell out if you want to. Just scream at me. We have mics. We have several mics around. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Finding an agent seems to be a problem for most new authors, and you seem to have a wonderful relationship with yours. How did you find him? How did, what were the criteria you used for selecting him? My, selecting my agent or my editor? The agent. The agent. The first agent selected me <laughs> because it was a random submission. I, I, had a list of, I had a list of 20 agents and a list of 20 publishers. We were just going down the list. The agents were people I'd read about, heard about. Uh, I knew they had other clients. Uh, I didn't, I'd done a lot of 
research, casual research uh, into publishing and how to submit and how, you know, all this stuff they tell you how to. Um, I bought a book one time, How to Become a Best Selling Author, written by a guy who hadn't sold anything. But I mean, I was, bu I, you know, I was buying all that stuff and it, it, consuming all that, you know, all this knowledge. And so uh, some of the agents I'd heard of, and um, I, I'm not vindictive, but I kept all the letters. Uh, <laughs> Most writers do, by the way. Uh, and he turned out to be a, a great asset. We had nothing in common. He was a much older guy. New York had been through the wars and you know, knew a lot, and he was, he was magnificent. He died suddenly in 1995 of a heart attack. And uh, at that time, I also got lucky, my first editor, the guy who bought the firm in 1990, uh, is one of my closest friends. And we've been together for 30 years. And in 1995, when my first agent died, I went to my editor and I said, I don't know anybody else in publishing, really. I don't trust anybody else. I want you to become my agent. And he wisely said yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like I, it, the team at Doubleday, most of them have been there for 25 years. These are they're friends of mine. I know them very well. I don't have to have a contract. Uh, I'm loyal to them. Loyalty for them is a book a year, a big book a year. Uh, loyalty for me is um, the team that publishes. It's, it's, it's going to be beautifully published every year. So I've been, been very blessed. Question? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, I can't hear you. What's, I'm sorry. A painted house? Oh, there you are right there. Okay, A Painted House is your favorite book? Okay, uh, the, that was uh, your, your favorite of all of them. You, she said they're all brilliant, okay? But that, <laughs> if I can paraphrase, she said that. You know, the, 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 I love that book. Uh, I have to love all of them to finish them, but look at looking back, and it's, it's impossible for me to, to rank them and you know, critique them or judge them or whatever. Some are better than others. Uh, but you have to love it to get through it. Uh, and you, you have to love it to start it. You, the idea has to be there after it could be a long time. A Painted House is a childhood memoir. The first seven years of my life, I was that kid on that cotton farm in Arkansas. That house was my grandparents' home. Uh, the grandparents are very similar to the people I described. Uh, many of the events were the, har the harvest, the picking cotton, which I did as a child, um, and chopping cotton all summer, and, and then the migrant workers came in. That's all, that's all very factual. It's from memory. I wanted to write the book, and it's about, it's about 20 years ago, while my parents were still alive, and they could help me with the details. Like, who had the first telephone in Black Elk, Arkansas, and how many, te uh, how many televisions were there? Who saw the first baseball game on, on TV in rural Arkansas? What year was it? Uh, my mother went into great length, or she tried to describe to me how you can vegetables and fruit for the wintertime. They, they had to grow all their own food. So it was, it, was, it was an experience I had with my folks that I really, I really enjoy. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed the book. It's one of my favorites, one of my favorites. And there's no lawyers in it, not a single lawyer. <laughs> all right, where are we? Who's yes, got a mic? Sir. Here you go. Hello. I've read all your books, and my favorite was The Testament, but what inspired you to write the Theodore Boone series? Because that was an excellent series as well. The well, children's thank you. Book. Um, it's very simple. About 10 years ago, my daughter had finished college, and she got a master's in education from UNC, and she was teaching her first assignment at a really wonderful school in Raleigh, and uh, she had fifth graders, right? Four, yeah, she had 25 fifth graders in her class. And Renee and I had gone down, helped her get her classroom together. We, we bought the library. I bought all 85 of the Hardy Boys books, okay? <laughs> and all of Nancy Drew, well, we had the, she had a library. She really pushed reading and literacy. She wanted her kids to read, read, read. And it just, she just had a wonderful time. Uh, she loves teaching, and she will someday go back to teaching uh, because she's She's kind of getting bored, I think, being a mom. Um, and over dinner one night, we, she, she had not been in, in the classroom a couple of months, and we were having dinner, 
and she asked me the very simple question. She said, Dad, can you write good suspense for kids? And I had never thought about that. Uh, she said they have a lot of books. They have uh, historical fiction. They have fantasy. They have what, what all sports, you know, nonfiction. But she said, I can't find any really good suspense for kids. And um, we just started talking about it. And it, it became kind of a family um, project. And so I came up with this kid, Theodore Boone, who's, who's 13 years old, only child. Both of his parents are lawyers. And all they, do, all they talk about is the law. And so Theo thinks he's a lawyer. And he, he gives uh, free legal advice to all of his friends <laughs> and stays in trouble all the time because of that. And uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good um, family project. When Ray, Ray read the first draft of the first one, <laughs> and her, her first comment was, there's no dog. You gotta have a dog, you know. You gotta have a dog. So uh, that's how Judge uh, came to life. He's a rescue, and he stays in trouble. And um, my favorite part of each Theo book is uh, there's seven of them now, and there's a you're you're caught up in the story, and suddenly there's a timeout, and you go to animal court, and it's totally fictional. It's, there's, I've never even remotely heard of anything about like animal court. But there's a place in the courtroom, in the basement, it's the lowest of all courts. <laughs> and you don't have to be a lawyer. You can walk in and try your own, like small claims court, walk in and try your own case, call witnesses, pretend to be a lawyer, whatever. Um, and so Theo loves it because he's always an animal court. And so as a family, we uh, each year try to come up with the next crazy animal story. We've had fainting goats, spitting llamas. We've had a boa constrictor. The last one was a, um, what kind of rabbit was it? Yeah, some kind of flop-eared rabbit who would get out at night in the neighborhood and flop on all the decks and send all the dogs into orbit. And <laughs> we've looked at videos of uh, some of these animals, some of the just crazy things uh, that animals do, and that's how we come up with the... Uh, See, I give long answers. If you ask a question, I'll give you a long answer. <laughs> yes, ma'am. John, thank you for being here tonight. I just want to say my father and myself are two of your biggest fans, and we always signed off all of our emails as Fitch and Marlene. So very beautiful memories of that. But the question I have for you is, have you followed the life at all of the young rape victim? Like whatever became of her after the novel came out? A little, uh, enough to know that I don't want to know. Um, yeah. There was a few years ago, 2000, 2014 was the 25th anniversary of the book or something like that. And a reporter um, found her uh, because of me, because, not because of my book, I never, I never gave any information about her. Um, and he, I made a mistake and I, I said her lawyer was a friend of mine. I was in law school with him. And um, he, the reporter was a guy I knew, did not get very aggressive and I asked him, I said, please give her all the privacy you can give her. I'm, I'm, I feel bad that I, if, if she would get some attention because of this story. And so we left it at that. So, I mean, I don't know how she's doing. I hope, I hope and pray she's doing great. I, but I don't know. Next. Yes, sir. How, how do you uh, reconcile your novel as you published it and the way the screenwriters in Hollywood present it on the screen? In other words, there are yeah, many um, cases where how you presented in the book were different than what was presented in the movie. Yeah. Um, very early on, I think right after The Firm came out, uh, I got a note in the mail from Stephen King. And he said uh, something, whatever. The book had just hit the New York Times bestseller list and was moving up. And Stephen wrote me a note and he said, just simply, welcome. He said, no, he said, I love the book, because he reads everything. And he said, I love the book, 
welcome to the big leagues. And I thought that was pretty classy. So uh, we struck up a conversation, and he, he came to Oxford, Mississippi, because he had never been to Mississippi, and he wanted to see some real live rednecks. And <laughs> he asked if I had a pickup truck, and I said, of course I have a pickup truck. He said, can we get in your truck and go low riding through the countryside and see some real rednecks in their native habitat? <laughs> sure, yeah, sure. So he stayed with us for, I don't know, two or three very long nights. <laughs> the first night he was there, we were still living in Oxford, and um, I, we'd been up late, and uh, Stephen, Stephen sobered up and quit drinking 40 years ago, and he's, 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 he's fiercely sober. He's very proud of it, and, but um, the others that night were not. Uh, <laughs> Nobody was excessive, but, you know, it was bed, bedtime for me. And I went to bed and by myself. And Renee came to the bed, bedroom. She hopped in the bed. She said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm, well, I was sleeping until you jumped in the bed. She said, you can't sleep. Stephen King's in the house. <laughs> I said, come on, Ray. He said, you know, he's just down the hall. He's okay. She said, I, I, I just can't do this. Uh, something bad is going to happen. And that... <laughs> And we were, we were just, in, you know, lying there uh, awake, and suddenly these two cats out of, came out of nowhere. There was a cat bite on the front porch. We didn't have cats, okay? And they were just screaming and screeching, and that woke us up, and there was a, we were almost asleep, and the, the wind kicked up, and there was a, something scratching the window. And I said, it's just a tree. She said, look, this is a new house. We don't have any trees, okay? <laughs> oh, and the alarm system kept beeping. The alarm, uh, a yellow light went off in the alarm monitor. We'd never seen a yellow light. It was all, all red and green, but no yellows, okay? And it beeped all night. And this, the whole night was like that because of Stephen King. And, it, <laughs> and he slept like a kid, you know? Uh, bother him. Long, to answer your question, uh, we, were, we were talking about movies. Uh, I, you know, Stephen's had every experience in the world from winning an Oscar uh, with Kathy Bates for... Um, misery, to actually filing a lawsuit one time to try to stop one of his books from being uh, the, the film from opening. It was so bad. So he's, he's had done everything. He gets way too involved in them. I've told him that. But he also told me this. This is 30 years ago. He said, when it comes to Hollywood, there are two groups of writers, those who do not sell to Hollywood. For whatever reason, just not going to do it. <laughs> That's a very small group. Uh, <clears throat> The other group consists of those of us who do, and if you're going to be in the second group, a couple of, a couple of simple rules. Get all your money up front, kiss it goodbye, and expect it to be something different. If you don't like that, go join the first group. And it's been great advice. It's been great advice from the, it's somebody else's interpretation, whether a screenwriter or even uh, certainly the director and producer. Uh, but even the actors oftentimes will change dialogue, you know, and at, between takes or whatever. So you really have no control over it. Are we one more? Up here. One more. I'm sorry, we're, we're, we're past due. Yes, ma'am. You got a mic? Yeah. Got gotcha. you. Go. By the way, you're pretty funny. <laughs> I didn't expect that. Anyway. I, um, I'm fascinated uh, by a writer's process. And I've heard writers say, and not really believe them, but I'm asking you, have you ever written a book, think you know the end or ending, you get almost all the way through it, and it ends itself, it, ha it presents itself with a different ending? It like takes over? Totally? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Good. No, here, listen, listen. I have a few rules for writing popular fiction. Um, and one of my rules is do not write the first scene until you know the last scene. 
John Irving is a writer I've admired for 40 years. He goes one step further. He says, he writes the last sentence before he writes the first sentence. I'm not that smart, um, but I know, I know what the ending is. And, and that takes a long time to get that process, that outline planned to that point. It often takes a long time. But once you, once you, have, once you know where you're going, you're not going to get lost. Writers are famous for having a brilliant idea, rushing in, writing like crazy, you know, for half a year or a year or whatever, you know, 50,000 words, 80,000 words, and then they can't see the end. And they wasted all that time. I'm far too lazy to do that, okay? <laughs> We're out of time. Thank you all very much. Let's hear it. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Uh, before you leave, uh, thank you, John. That was tremendous. I have an announcement to make, and that is I, I know many of you are going to be with us tomorrow. And if you've been following the saga of America Dirt, America Dirt, American Dirt, uh, a great book, that her book tour has been canceled, but we have found a video of her in a bookstore in DC that we're going to be playing in the Savannah Theater in place of her appearance. So you're welcome to come and see her. I've seen the video. It's, it's a great discussion of how she went about researching this book in Mexico, in soup kitchens, all, all over. And I encourage you, if you're interested in the book, which is a great book and number one, one of the top books right now, to come and see that in the Savannah Theater. And with that, let's thank John Grisham again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to you. Nice you can go down. All right.